Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth in Wilmington, North Carolina here. It is Monday, the 6th of February, 2023. And today we're going to talk about this powerful ocean storm off the east coast of the United States, non-tropical in nature. Nevertheless, we will talk about that. That will lead off today's discussion. We will also look, at, of course, at lower 48 weather, a warmer pattern this week than we saw, especially towards the tail end of last week, and especially for New England, a much different pattern right now. And we will also take a look at El Nino, or La Nina, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon, or ENSO, for short, E-N-S-O. We will take a gander at that and some of the larger puzzle pieces that we keep track of here in the off-season. Good to have you join me. Let's start off here uh, with a look at the satellite animation, courtesy of TropicalTidbits.com. There is the non-tropical area of low pressure. Intense. Yes, definitely intense out there. Big waves, high winds, even hurricane-force wind warning here offshore for the potential of hurricane-force wind. Even though this isn't a hurricane, it could generate winds to hurricane intensity. So mariners definitely want to keep an eye on that. And um, elsewhere, I did want to point out this snowpack out west. This is good to see, especially way out west here, the Rockies, the uh, Intermountain West, the Great Basin, the, the Sierra, the Cascades over here. Really good to see that snowpack. That helps. It really does. It's important. The water problems that were uh, been burgeoning out west over the last 10 to 20 years just getting worse. And anytime you can get a lot of snowpack like we're seeing this year, that is a good thing. All right, here is the tweet that I was telling you about from TAF B, the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. Uh, they are mentioning this intense low pressure area and the cold front that is associated with it. It's non tropical in nature. You know, it can certainly have tropical storm to hurricane force wind and gale force winds that are mentioned in the tweet and in the infographic. And the bottom line, again, we talk about labels, how things are labeled, what we call them as non-tropical, subtropical, a hurricane, a tropical storm. These are just classifications at the end of the day. In this particular situation, the mariners out there, whether they be cargo ships, anybody on a big sailboat, eh, hopefully not a small sailboat, and even the cruise ship industry, maybe someone's trying to get to Bermuda. I don't know how often they, the cruise lines sail to Bermuda during the winter or you're heading south and east towards past the Bahamas, maybe towards uh, Puerto Rico or beyond, yes, you go through the front of that system, and there are some pretty big thunderstorms associated, associated, I can talk, with that. And we can see that here as I enlarge the infographic. This is a couple hours old, the satellite picture is, but there's the tail end of the front with strong thunderstorms. So yes, this is of interest to mariners. It'll generate some pretty big waves, and those can impact as swells to parts of the east coast of the U.S. in the next few days. So just keep an eye out for that. Maybe some additional overwash uh, coming in at the times of high tide. A little added energy into the ocean from this system. Uh, Non-tropical in nature, but interesting to see nevertheless. Here's the wave guidance here. Um, very, very rough seas overall. The animation of the combined seas forecast in feet related to that intense low pressure area. And uh, this moves on out towards, this is where it is now. Some of those waves in there, 12, 14, even higher uh, feet. And then that all moves on out into the Atlantic over the next few days. All right, let's move along now to the Southern Oscillation Index. This is one of the biggest tools that I use, the most important ones. When this is strongly positive, consistently positive, we are generally in La Nina. When it's negative, consistently negative, and strongly negative, the overall pressure pattern of the tropical Pacific is one that supports El Nino, or the abnormal warming of the tropical Pacific. As you can see, the numbers, while they have come down generally here in the last several days, it's not a very steep decline. And even the 90-day has gained a little bit. The 90-day is very important because that's your longer duration snapshot. Well, it's less of a snapshot and more of a trend. The snapshot would be your 30 days, I guess, is a better way to look at it. And the 90-day average is still sitting at 13. And typically, the Bureau of Meteorology down in Australia classifies the SOI being above 7 as in general La Nina-type territory. And all this does is tells us about the pressure patterns. When the pressures are lower in the Western Pacific, you generally have those trade winds moving towards that lower pressure at a more brisk pace. 
and you keep the water stirred up, a La Nina in place. It's when that pressure pattern changes and the pressure pattern is lower east in the Pacific that you switch those winds around to more westerly where they come from the west across the Pacific and you change things up. We haven't seen that yet. It's not in the SOI numbers. It's starting to show up a little bit in some of the guidance, but it's February. We're getting close to spring. Lots of changes going on the way the planet uh, switches around the seasons and the modeling tries to figure all that out and it can have a rough time of it. So just keep that in mind as we progress. But you know, some of the interesting tools that we have, one of them being the actual anomalies, and here we are. This is the tropical Pacific here. The main Enso area is still cold relative to average. A little bit of a warm up here in the eastern parts of the Enso regions, as we call it. But then look at the Atlantic. Everything now warmer than average. Nothing alarmingly so. I guess the Gulf of Mexico is still quite warm relative to average, as is the southwest Atlantic. But everything else, just slightly warmer than normal all across the Atlantic. Just a few pockets here and there of cold anomalies, but nothing standing out at all as being colder than average. And as we get closer to June, and the models figure everything out more, hopefully, we will get a lock on what happens here. And again, I do think we do leave La Nina behind, transition to warm neutral, maybe by the fall, a weak El Nino, but if the Atlantic stays warmer than average, it could sort of offset that, especially if we're not going to have an overpowering El Nino like we saw in 2015. And that's sort of the key here. These strong La Ninas like what we saw, especially last year, that tends to sort of throw a big monkey wrench into things one way, very much colder than average in the Pacific. On the other hand, if it's really warm relative to average, it throws that monkey wrench in in another big way because everything's warmer, more moisture is added to the atmosphere. It's those in-between times, even kind of like the Goldilocks zone. You know, that book, that story, I guess it was a book, uh, definitely applies here. The just right area where the Pacific is not so much colder or warmer than average to where it just kind of screws everything up. That in between time, we might be approaching that for 2023 hurricane season. And if the Atlantic stays warm like we're seeing now and it doesn't drop to below average, especially in the deep tropics, it could be busy. And again, it doesn't even matter in the end, does it? No. It matters where whatever forms ends up. And if that's your backyard or your community, that could be very problematic. So anyway, these are the big puzzle pieces we watch. This is another one of them, the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, much warmer than average overall. Your shelf waters are always going to be colder, easier to upwell the shallow waters there. Look at the area right off of the east coast here in the mid-Atlantic states. Way warmer, almost off the chart there. And that's in the vicinity of where that storm is passing through. So yes, some temperature gradients in the atmosphere and in the ocean, some very warm water temperatures for that system to take advantage of that is sitting off the mid-Atlantic in the uh, open western Atlantic. All right, looking at the CFS Inso plumes, as I like to call it, CFS V2. Uh, this gets updated every day. The Nino 3.4 region is just a specific area of the Pacific. I'll bring up a graphic that one of our back-end supporters made for us and show you that next week when we go over these numbers. Bring me back on for a second. Remember, I like to talk to you and not at you all the time. It's interesting though, looking at these uh, different models here, the reds are your older ones, the blues are your more recent runs, and we talk about divergence, right, especially when we look at tropical cyclone tracks, when everything's nice, nice and clustered tightly, we have more confidence in the forecast. When you get those big spreads, then the confidence is lower, it just makes sense. Well today's update, and remember this is every day. So you're going to see a lot of different wild changes over time. That's where the median or the mean here, uh, the forecast mean is important. But look at these most recent blue members. There's some that are going to tank once we get towards the fall, back to La Nina. Some that are just moderately warm at all. And then some that are quite warm in, in El Nino territory. In other words, a pretty big spread today. And I think that's reasonable and acceptable because... We're in February, and the model, this one, the Euro, uh, other models that do output 
on a regular basis. It's just hard to figure out. It really is. We're getting closer to spring. It's called the spring predictability barrier. It's just interesting to watch weekly to see if we can detect any changes that we can hang our hat on. One thing that is interesting, it's been a gradual warm-up. We're not seeing a big spike yet. So until and unless we see that, and until and unless we see the SOI really tank, we're still going to be just slowly transitioning out of this uh, cold phase, the La Nina here, slowly. And that's important to note. All right, real quick as we wrap things up here over the next few minutes, there are the hurricane force wind warnings well offshore in the open Atlantic there. But it matters, again, for any shipping interest out there. Hopefully no sailboats per se. But yes, any of the big cargo ships, um, yeah, they're going to want to know about that. That interesting red color that you don't often see outside of hurricane season. That is your offshore and they can even be in nearshore waters, but luckily in this case, this particular storm is well offshore. Notice, though, the rest of the lower 48 here, I'm just going to kind of generally outline it, blank. And not entirely blank, but pretty darn close to it. No uh, big wind chill warnings or anything like that. No big winter storms. Just a few random areas of smaller impact storm systems coming in right now in the deep south and uh, the heart of Dixie down here, I guess. Mississippi Valley, whatever you want to call it. Um, is it Dixie? I don't know. I'm just trying here. The Mississippi Valley's true. A few river flood warnings because it's been kind of wet. But again, overall, a quieter pattern than we have seen in the last week or so. And definitely a lot warmer than we have seen in recent days, especially up here in New England, where it was so cold, I read that the trees were cracking and creaking, and some of them were exploding because cold water expands. I still haven't been able to wrap my brain around that. Why does cold water for and, and ice expand? That just doesn't make sense to me because you think of cold as being less movement in the air molecules, but whatever. I'm not a, a physicist. We'll just leave that alone. But yes, it was very cold in the Northeast. At least it's not so bad. Now, moving on along real quick, there's that storm off the uh, coast there. 979 analyzed about now, or at least the forecast is. This is the GFS valid right about now. Move this out into time. That scoots on up into the Atlantic, staying offshore of the Maritimes and Atlantic Canada. That's, that's a good thing. And then as the week progresses, a uh, nice high pressure area here off the southeast coast of the U.S. The return flow around it will bring moisture, warm temperatures, probably some fog along the coastal areas down here. So be ready for that. And then, yeah, this is a good thing to see. More moisture for the Pacific Northwest, the Cascades, the coastal ranges. Rain down in the lower elevations. It is a positive in the end. You might not like it. It might be dreary, but it is, a good, it is good to see for sure. Moving along throughout the rest of the week, another storm system pops up in uh, parts of the nation's midsection. A little bit of snow on the back end of it that progresses, you guessed it, along the west side of this strong Atlantic Ridge that's sitting out here. So the storms can't dip down and then come up the east coast, not with this big old area of high pressure in the way. They get forced up and over like this. That's the general storm track. Uh, overall, the uh, energy comes out of Canada. Your low pressure areas form somewhere in the mid-south, um, southern plains, and off they go. And there's another one as we get towards the end of the week, into the weekend. A little bit more cold air involved this time, some storminess, but nothing major, no big blockbuster storms that everybody's going to lose their minds over. We don't see any of that coming up anytime soon. And in fact, a week from now, it's almost the same thing. One week out, big old area of high pressure off the southeast United States, return flow, it's the same song and dance. Didn't Groundhog Day already happen? Ha ha. Uh, but it is. It's an interesting pattern. We just keep kind of recycling it, uh, at least as we see going forward here into February. Next week at this time, I would basically be talking about the same thing it looks like, minus, hopefully, the big ocean storm off the East Coast. All right. One more thing before I let you go. That is severe weather. Nothing too substantial here. Nothing today. But as we go out to tomorrow, marginal risk here in parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas. Uh, so just keep your eyes peeled for that. Some of that marginal area could get upgraded to a slight risk. We'll see. That shifts to the Gulf Coast region and the interior portions of the Gulf Coast states. 
Louisiana, Eastern Texas, of course, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida Panhandle, I-10, I-20 corridors. Yeah, be on the lookout for that as we get into the later part. Uh, what is that, midweek or so, Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that. And then days four through eight, luckily predictability is too low. So no severe weather to worry about on a big scale as we move through the next several days. All right, so there you go, a general look at everything, starting with our big old ocean storm off the East Coast. And in so, of course, we'll keep watching that every week. I'll do an update on how that progresses. And um, once we get into March and April, we'll start getting some guidance, uh, especially from our friend Ben Knoll, some of the super blends that he puts up from the UK Met and the Euro, and we'll get a look at some things related to the hurricane season. But that's still several weeks away right now, and we're in February, and we just look at it on a weekly basis. All right? All right, speaking of weekly, have a good rest of your week. As always, thanks for tuning in and giving me a part of your day. I do appreciate it. I am Mark Suddeth. We are Hurricane Track. I'll talk to you again next Monday.